Welcome to the Non-Obvious Book Awards. It is time, finally. We have been reading books all year. We have been looking forward to this, and I know you have as well. It is finally a chance for us to announce the shortlist, the winners, and a bunch of other fun stuff. We're going to talk about the best book cover designs uh, of the entire year. I'm going to give you an inside peek uh, at the hundreds of books that we looked at, and we're going to continue some of the work that we've been doing over the last week, which you might have seen where we've been talking about trends trends and book trends and, and how we can understand the world through books. So if you love books, if you love the best books of the year, and if you want to find out what you should be reading, especially uh, in the holidays coming up, this is the show that's going to reveal all of that. And we're going to start by taking a quick look at some of the trends uh, over the past uh, year. And in specific, we had six trends that uh, we spotlighted throughout the year through a daily post, which you might have seen on LinkedIn. And if you haven't, you can go back and check those out. Uh, but every week, uh, every day of last week, we posted a new trend. And these were the six trends. And what I thought I'd do is take you through each one of those. And that's one of the things that we're going to do. But let me share with you the program for everything that we're going to talk about uh, leading into uh, this show. So we're going to talk about the long list finalists because we announced the long list, uh, which is 75 books of which the top 15 we're going to talk about and reveal today. Uh, the six top trends, which I mentioned, the best book titles of 2021, the best book cover designs, the shortlist finalists, and then our five book award winners. So that is our plan for today. And if you're interested in how we evaluate these books, which is probably one of the first questions that comes to mind, which is how do you pick, especially when we had so many books to choose from? Well, here's an image of how we read these books and, and where we find ideas in them. And we use these colored tabs and it's a whole part of this method that my team and I have been using to try and identify the best ideas from something and pull them out in a way that we can actually make useful for us. And so when we did that, I mentioned that the first thing that we uh, announced um, was our long list. And the long list was our favorite 75 books. And I know that sounds like a lot. I mean, it is a long list, but there were so many books to pick from that the hardest thing, honestly, was knowing that there were so many authors who wrote amazing books that we were not going to get a chance to, to spotlight. Um, in here. And so this is a single image of all of the books on the long list. But if you go to nonobviousbookawards.com, you can see the entire list uh, and actually get links to go and pick up those books. And I highly recommend you do because they were fantastic reads, every single book on the long list. So as I mentioned, as we went through all of the books and we were choosing the long list, we also identified several trends. Uh, and so I wanted to spotlight some of those trends and in specific six big trends from our work uh, in 2021. And the first trend is new work. And like I said, you can read an article about each one of these. And what I want to do quite quickly is spotlight each one of these, because under each one of these trends, we had some sub trends. And what I love about trends, and if you know any of my work and you know the things that I've written about, you know that I'm big on trends. And specifically when it comes to looking at books, hundreds of books published over the last year, we can spotlight lots of trends and learn lots of things about this past year that we all lived through, through the trends. And so new work was one of them because the nature of how we work has totally changed. And there were a couple of sub trends under that, you know, the flexibility of work and how work is shifting in terms of us being able to work remotely or in the office or both uh, hybrid work. There was overload uh, as we struggled to find the new balance, especially when home and office and the refrigerator were all like right next to each other uh, to try and figure out a way to, to navigate this new world of work and how we work, the nature of work itself. These were all challenges that we had to kind of deal with throughout. And so those were three under new work. Uh, the second big shift, the second big trend was about the power shift. And if you saw so many different books talking about the nature of who has power, who can get power, where there's inequity uh, in power, corruption, well, it was a big trend in terms of like who's winning through corruption, uh, who are manipulators and why are they winning and how do we maybe prevent that? How do we reclaim control? So how do we get around the corner there and change who has the power? from one group to another uh, and how that's happening sometimes. And how do we choose and change? And change is always a big topic when it comes to business books. And we saw that again over the past year. 
The next big trend was coming together. And coming together was this sense that now that we have this sort of reset moment in the world, how do we change the way our societies operate so that we actually support one another? How do we heal society, healing society? And this was a funny one because we identified this healing society trend. We posted this, uh, and then the following week, Google did their annual search, uh, year in search report, and healing was their big finding, that people were searching for topics on healing. So it's so interesting because Google and things people were Googling was exactly the same thing that we saw in books when it came to healing society, when it comes to understanding others, getting a better sense of why others think the way that they do, especially when they don't agree with you. Uh, and avoiding extremism, trying to bridge this divide that has has happened in politics and media uh, and in beliefs between people. And how do we bring those together? So, uh, again, lots of books about that. Uh, trend number four that we spoke focused on was an uncertain future. Uh, and it really was. There was a lot of uncertainty. I mean, future is a huge topic for books. I've written about the future, too. It's a big topic for me um, as a writer. But. We saw many books talking about saving humanity, saving society, regenerating the Earth's environment. Um, there were lots and lots of books about that. Uh, many books turned the clock backwards. They looked at history. Where have we been and how can we learn from that? And you'll see that theme also emerge in some of the winners that we're going to share with you uh, very shortly. Uh, innovators and stories of innovators' lives how they changed the world, what they came up with, and what lessons we could learn from those. That was another big theme that we saw. And the fifth one was You First. And this was really this whole group of books talking about changing the balance of how we treat work and the things that we need to do versus our own mental health, putting ourselves first, prioritizing ourselves. I mean, that was a big, big theme, prioritize you, uh, that we saw in the media and culture and also in, in books. Um, focus on your inner voice, listen to your inner voice, act on it um, was another theme. And the growth mindset, the idea that what you know and what you learn is not fixed. You can always be better. You can always grow. And that, again, was another theme that we saw coming across lots and lots of books. So um, again, these are the six trends. Before I share the last one, there were six trends that we focused on. Uh, you can read an article. There's actually a series of six articles on my LinkedIn and then also um, on my blog. Uh, and you can read the entire articles where we spotlight every single book that we found under each one of those. So if you're interested in any of those trends, there's lots more to read about it. I kind of gave you a very quick taste of it before we jump into the, the actual award winners um, and some other insights about the book. So hopefully that's interesting for you. And the last one on this list was uh, end bias and bias, racism, uh, social justice. These were all huge themes throughout the year. Uh, and so there were several books talking about the systems of bias. Uh, so the way that bias has been institutionalized and what we might want to do to, to try and rethink that, or at least understand why it happened and how it exists the way that it is. Uh, how do we create more equity in the world? Uh, that was another big theme that we saw. And the last one, which gave me a lot of hope, and I, I put my own book uh, that I co-authored with Jennifer Brown called Beyond Diversity into this category, uh, the one that we recently released. And it was all about taking action. So how do we not just uh, talk about ending bias, but how do we actually take action to make that happen? So those were some of the trends in a very fast tour of, uh, I feel like one of those like Broadway shows where it's like the 90 minutes of the history of the world or like every Shakespearean play in, in uh, 45 minutes. But, you know, that was kind of what we did with these, with these book trends. It was every book uh, spotlighted into six trends and some sub trends in, I don't know how many minutes that was, but uh, maybe you were timing me and you can tell. But anyway, it was fascinating to see all of these different trends. And it really gave us some insight that led us towards examining books uh, from a different perspective. And so as many of you know, beyond being an author and uh, the founder of the non-obvious company, I co-founded a publishing company uh, with my wife, Chubby. And as part of that, we look at a lot of different details around books. And one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is book titles. Um, and if you've ever authored a book, you know that titling a book is a big, big, uh, uh, important task. Uh, but even if you haven't written a book, you know, titling anything uh, is an important task. I mean, we we wouldn't call it this, but like titling slash naming your kids. I mean, that's kind of, you know, that's an important thing. Like that's going to be with them for their entire lives. So like we got to get the titles right, basically, uh, is what I what I want to say. 
And there were 10 specific books that I thought had really great titles. And what I wanted to do is very quickly spotlight for you why I thought they were they were great and just give them a little uh, bit of a shout out. Um, the first one was The Basic Laws of Human Stupidity uh, by Carlo M. Cipolla. And this one's been around for a while, actually. It's sort of republished this year. Uh, but I mean, when you hear a title like that, The Basic Laws of Human Stupidity, I mean, who wouldn't want to read that to find out what those laws are, right? It has intrigue. Uh, and great titles have intrigue. And this one really did that. And so I love that title. Uh, Probable Impossibilities by Alan Lightman. And he's an amazing physicist slash poet. One of my favorite books ever, Einstein's Dreams, was written by him. Uh, in his latest book, Probable Impossibilities, I just thought there was a nice a duality between those two things, especially based on who he is. And sometimes there's two words that are not made up, but they just work together really interestingly. And I thought that title did that, which was which was really cool. Uh, the next one that I really liked was Leading Things You Didn't Start. Super simple title, but how often are leaders or are we placed in that position where we have to take on something that was someone else's, right? And we see signs all the time of, of this not invented here mentality where like, it's not my thing. I didn't start it, though, therefore I shouldn't care about it or therefore I shouldn't finish it. And honestly, the world and companies and a lot of things would be better off if we didn't default to that, if we were better at leading things that we didn't start. And so I really loved the just the very, the simple but non-obvious nature of this title because as soon as I read it, I'm like, yeah, you know, we do need a book, not just about leadership, but like leading something you didn't start. Um, I get why we would need a book like that. Um, so that was good. Uh, the next one is That Sounds Fun, uh, which is a book all about uh, enjoying the fruits of being an amateur uh, and, and taking on more hobbies. And this was one of those titles where as soon as I read it, I thought, yeah, that's what someone would say when they became an amateur and started doing something like knitting that that they wanted to do for the joy of it. And so it really evoked an emotion um, through what it actually said, which was a phrase that people might say to themselves. Uh, the next one I liked was a title called Believing is Seeing. And this one sort of flips what we typically hear, which is seeing is believing. And it's actually a theoretical physicist talking about religion. Um, and talking about why he believes in religion, which is an unusual thing for a scientist to write a book about uh, religion in a positive way. Uh, and so that alone was intriguing, uh, but the title was a nice flip of a cliche, which sometimes is a cool thing to do when you're titling, which is take something everybody's heard, seeing is believing, and flipping it around, um, just to give that little bit of a, a twist. The next one that I liked was uh, called There She Was, and it was a history of the Miss uh, America. I can't remember actually if it was the Miss America or Miss USA um, or, or maybe both, um, but uh, but it was a great title because it, it sort of played off of that whole kind of There She Goes, Miss America song and the heritage of it. And it was just a really nice play on uh, the, the, the theme, if you would remember that from the topic. And it was, uh, it was really a well-written book, um, as well, and kind of explored an interesting part of, of history, um, that we don't typically hear. Next one I liked was a pretty powerful title, How to Not Die Alone, <laughs> um, which is a book all about finding someone to spend your life with. Uh, and it, was pretty, I mean, it's profoundly direct, that particular title. Uh, but it does speak to what I think is the greatest fear for many people, uh, which is being alone uh, for a long period of time and dying alone. And so it really kind of evoked that emotion and uh, was a practical, I mean, it's a practical guide. It's meant to be a practical guide. But it really did speak to that one thing that seemed really, really um, scary which is, you know, oh my gosh, I don't want to, I don't want to die alone. Um, next book that, uh, that I liked the title was High Conflict. Um, and High Conflict elevated something that we've all dealt with at some point, which is conflict uh, between people. And it re-described it as something that is not insurmountable. Um, and so I liked this brand. It was sort of like branding conflict as a different way of thinking about it. Uh, and I thought the title did that really nicely. And so that was one of my favorites as well. 
Next one was My Robot Gets Me, which is all about social design and making products that are more human. And I love that they had the kind of smiley face Roomba um, there because it's it's all about the interactivity of products. And I think that we're going to see this more and more over the next decade, which is how are products designed to be more intuitively human and, and to relate to us. And so a book about helping designers to do that um, just felt spot on. And I love the way that the title kind of brought that to life so that immediately you could understand what this book was about from that title. And the last one that I want to spotlight a title for is Two Beats Ahead. Um, and Two Beats Ahead was uh, a book about the intersection between music, uh, musical minds and innovation. Um, and so I, 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 I just like the double play of like two beats ahead. I mean, obviously we're talking about music uh, here, but also, you know, what does it mean to be two beats ahead and how could a musical mind help you get there from an innovation point of view? And so that was really, really interesting for me. Um, and uh, those were some of the titles of books that I loved. And what I want to do next, and this is, I promise, the last thing we're going to do before we get to the big awards announcement um, of all of the awards is spotlight some of my favorite covers, book covers um, of the year. And so let's jump into some of the best book covers. And the first one that I want to share, um, and I don't actually, I don't actually have the books here. I forgot to bring them. So um, Chubby, who's my live producer, maybe you can just show them. Uh, you can show each one, um, and then I'll just talk about it. Um, I was gonna hold them up, but I actually left them somewhere else. So um, maybe. Uh, we can start with, uh, let me see, let's start with the story of work. We're going to do a little roulette here. So um, I'll just announce one and then uh, Chubby, maybe you can flash it up and uh, and show them um, and then we can do it that way. So, um, oh, otherwise, okay, here, live. We're getting them live. <laughs> this just in, a news bulletin. We got the book. Thank you. <laughs> we got the books in. So I'm very happy. I'm very excited. Uh, so here we go. We are going to be able to do this live because my producer managed to find a solution uh, to, my, uh, to my problem and my screw up. So first book cover I want to share with you is The Story of Work. Um, and this cover in particular, um, love the design of it. You can sort of see it carries through to the back, beautiful colors um, integrated in here. And it's actually a consortium of artists uh, from various different places that uh, put this cover together. And if you can look at the details of it, it really does show work across the ages, which is kind of the topic of the book. And so beautiful cover, amazing art, but also aligns perfectly with the nature of the book itself. And so loved, loved, loved that cover. Uh, the second one that I want to spotlight is Battle for the Big Top, which is really the history of the circus. Um, and Battle for the Big Top, this one uh, is done by uh, a designer that I know well. We've actually used him on a couple of projects of ours, um, Pete Garceau. And this was just a really nice stylized cover because if you imagine the old days of the circus, like you probably picture a certain style. And that cover was that style. Uh, which I really appreciated about it. I thought it was great. Um, this one, we gave it away a little bit, um, but this one, uh, Subtract, uh, was a great cover, not so much because of the front cover, but sometimes, I mean, if you can look inside here, what you'll see is um, the entire book description, what it says is less is more. And what you would actually see is all of the words that are black here are actually cut out, like, uh, you know, strike through. And everything else is highlighted. So you could literally just read the highlighted words and have a simplified version of a description of the book, which I thought was a really clever way of bringing this idea of the book uh, to life. Really nicely done there. Next one that uh, I'll share is Reset, uh, Press Reset. Um, and Press Reset is a, a book about the video game industry um, and how cutthroat it can be. And I just thought it was a nice way that the author brought to life the uh, different elements of it. You can see sort of a guy here who presumably worked in the video game industry carrying a box um, because he's seemingly been fired. Uh, the entire elements of it are totally like a video game would be. Um, it was just a nice stylized way of bringing that particular topic to life. Um, and I thought that was a nice one. Uh, this book, which also made it to our long list, uh, was called Fuzz. Um, and fuzz is about the relationship between humans and, and uh, nature um, and why we sometimes create the problems that we have between wildlife and humans. And you can't tell here, but the badge on the cover 
is sort of done like one of those Boy Scout badges and it's actually raised. So it's got like a texture to it. Um, and so the printing that they've done on this is really nice and it brings to life this kind of idea that goes through the um, the theme of the book. And, and the image on the book is actually a bear foraging through trash, which is one of the central stories that they tell um, in the book. So really nicely done. Another cover I really liked was uh, this book, which is called Thinking Better, um, The Art of the Shortcut in Math and Life. And it's very simple. The visual is very simple. I mean, it's just, it's literally taking a shortcut around a maze <laughs> instead of trying to go through it. And based on that visual, you can kind of get a sense of what the book is about. And I think sometimes when you think about beautiful book covers, like that's what they do. They give you a sense of what the book's about just from the cover itself. And so that one was was very nicely, nicely done. This one uh, was just a standout cover in terms of the colors used. And it was super simple. Um, one of the choices that I really liked here, which is quite unusual, especially for business books, is there's no subtitle listed. And so the clean nature of the title and the author's name really come through um, on the cover. And so sometimes when you leave something off, uh, it allows the cover design to really pop in terms of what the, what the book um, is able to deliver as an impact. Another title I loved, Bad News, um, the cover here. Uh, this one um, is very unique. You can't tell from the uh, from that, but if you actually open the dust jacket flap here, you'll see, whoop, there you go. You can see right through it. So it's really interesting how they chose to print that. Um, and, uh, and it sort of brings to life the, uh, the, the, um, kind of images on the, on the front here. So it was just a uniquely done book. And sometimes, uh, when you're browsing in a bookstore and you have something like that, I imagine, you know, this one probably stood out. Uh, because of that. So it was just well done. Two more to go. Um, this book here, uh, Kim Scott, uh, Just Work. If you're familiar with Radical Candor or any of the previous titles, um, you know that this really fits into a series. And, and I thought that the designers did a great job of A, picking a very unusual color. Um, you don't typically see books that are this color. Uh, and B, using pretty much exactly the same design as the previous book, which was a huge bestseller. Um, and so when you have a book that's a huge bestseller, that's recognizable, you got to use the same branding. Um, and so to me, this was a great cover example of something that didn't need to be rethought. And so they didn't, they just took the same design, changed the color of it, made it a unique color and, and put it out there. And anyone who was a fan of the author already would easily find this new book and, and, uh, you know, and pick it up. The last book I want to share with you, and this is the last best cover design, and then we're going to jump into the announcements for the shortlist, is this book, uh, which is Will Smith's autobiography um, called Will. Uh, and it is an amazingly done cover. I actually wrote about it because Will an, an, uh, launched his book the same day we launched Beyond Diversity. We both used uh, artists to create the artwork for our covers. Uh, but with this cover in particular, there's some great videos on social media where you can watch the artist actually drawing uh, the cover elements um, directly. So you can actually dig into this one a little bit, which is kind of cool. Um, it's kind of fun. So anyway, those were uh, some of the best covers of the year uh, that we selected. Uh, we talked about some of the best titles of the year, and now we are ready for our shortlist selections. So here we go with the shortlist. And the first shortlist winner is Backable by Sunil Gupta. Uh, Backable by Sunil Gupta is a shortlist winner for the Non-Obvious Book Awards 2021. And it is an amazing book about how to be somebody that you... Uh, can generate an audience for, and people want to support you. Uh, how do you become backable, as uh, Sunil writes about? Um, and I had the chance to interview him, actually, on my show several months ago. And he shares some really interesting insights about what it took to be backable. And I want to share with you a quote from the book uh, that'll give you a sense of what it's about. So Sunil writes, bring the people you're counting on into your creative process so they feel like co-owners of your idea. Even if it feels uncomfortable, don't be afraid to let people put their fingerprints on your projects. Make them an insider and they'll feel invested in your success. 
And that's really what this book is about. It's about what are the habits of people who are backable? Um, and I thought it was a great, valuable, useful book. Uh, and so it was part of our shortlist. The next title uh, on our shortlist is Under a White Sky by Elizabeth Colbert. Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future by Elizabeth Colbert was selected for the 2021 Non-Obvious Book Awards shortlist. This book was amazingly written um, and really looks at what it is going to take for humans, the source of so much trouble in nature, to flip the script um, and to become one of the sources of actually fixing it and whether that's even possible in the first place. And so the book just has this amazing kind of engaging writing. And let me share with you a quote from it so you can sort of get a sense of how it's written. We have become the major driver of extinction and also probably of speciation. So pervasive is man's impact. It is said that we live in a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. In the age of man, there is nowhere to go that does not already bear our Friday-like footprints. So what she writes about is going to these amazing places, and she has this wonderful story of the world's rarest fish that grows in a uh, in a sinkhole in areas in a de in the desert uh, that has evolved into that space, uh, and talks about what it would take to save that uh, fish, and then brings out those lessons kind of elsewhere as well. And so it's just a really great read. This one is a is a, a pretty quick read as well, uh, but. Just a just a delight, um, and we're we're thrilled to put it on our short list. Next title is "Dirty Work" uh, by AL Press. "Dirty Work" by AL Press is shortlisted for the 2021 Non Obvious Book Awards. This was one of my favorite reads uh, that I actually had the chance to uh, to go through and read because it takes a different approach. And when you first hear the words dirty work, you might think, oh, people are doing work with li literally dirty work with dirt. Uh, but actually what this book is about is people who do work that is uh, morally reprehensible to some of us. So people who order drone attacks or people who are working as guards in, in maximum or minimum security prisons. And what the author does is he goes into those situations, interviews the people who are in those situations, and really spotlights some uh, insights that you might not have ever thought about uh, if you've never known anyone who's worked in a sort of dirty job, as he calls it. And so one of the quotes that stood out for me in this book was, moral injuries were an occupational hazard for anyone whose job involved perpetrating, failing to prevent, or bearing witness to acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs, for most dirty workers, that is. So this idea of moral injury was all over this book, and it really got me thinking about how we should have more empathy for people who have to do this type of work uh, through circumstance in many cases. They, they don't have many other options, and they have to do this work that's really hard. Uh, and and really plays with your uh, your mental health uh, and, and in a negative way impacts it. Uh, and this book opened my eyes to a lot of that that I wasn't really thinking about before. And and sometimes what these books on our shortlist do is they open our eyes to something in an entirely different world or an entirely different space that doesn't fit our own. Um, and that's a huge value uh, from these books. And that's what this book managed to do. The next book uh, on our list was Future Proof by Kevin Roos. Future Proof, Nine Rules for Humans in the Age of Automation by Kevin Roos was selected for the 2021 Non-Obvious Book Awards shortlist. This book was an interesting take on the future because it starts with an opening story that really spotlights what you're going to get from the book, where the author goes to several Silicon Valley events and hears people talking about the benefits of AI and automation. And what strikes him most is not so much that the technology uh, is taking off, but that the ethics of the people who are creating the technology seem to be entirely missing. And let me share with you a quote from this book to give you a sense of what that, uh, of how he writes about that. I'm much less worried when it comes to the technology itself. I still believe that well-designed AI and automation could radically improve many people's lives. I'm much more worried about the humans who are designing and implementing all of this new technology. 
So the people behind the technology are really the big challenge because if they don't have any empathy for the jobs who are uh, they're trying to displace through the technology or how the technology interacts with people, we're in for, for a bad situation in the future. Um, and so it, it really echoes this idea that many others have been sharing also that teaching ethics uh, to people who are developing technology and to the next generation of students who will be developing the technology is super important uh, because if they don't have that, then the robots really will take over and, and there's nothing we'll be able to do about it. So this book had that and then it gave you nine specific rules. And so it was very pragmatic um, in terms of like, what do we do with that um, now? And so I enjoyed that piece of it as well. Next election for the shortlist was a book called The World in a Selfie by Marco D'Armo. The World in a Selfie, an inquiry into the tourist age by Marco D'Armo was selected for the 2021 non-obvious book awards shortlist. This was a book that was translated from Italian and offered a really unique perspective on the power of tourism and how tourism uh, reaches across to so many other different industries and, and has a role to play in what buildings get constructed, uh, how we actually structure the nature of our politics, who is in power and who isn't. Uh, it really was an exploration of tourism on a level that you don't typically see. Uh, and it was, it was just wonderfully translated and had some really interesting passages. I mean, let me share with you one of the passages from the book, a quote from the book. We're used to thinking of real industry as mining, steel, manufacturing, ship, and car building. So we view tourism as a kind of postmodern frill, as superstructural rather than foundational. But the truth is that tourism is the most important industry of the century. Most important industry of the century. So already you're getting a sense of what the perspective is going to be. But this was just a really well, uh, well done, readable book about tourism on a level that you don't typically hear, uh, which was really interesting. So that one was one of our shortlist selections. The next book on our shortlist is a book called Useful Delusions by Shankar Vendatam and Bill Nessler. Useful Delusions, The Power and Paradox of the Self-Deceiving Brain by Shankar Vendatam and Bill Nessler was selected for the 2021 Non-Obvious Book Award shortlist. You might have heard of Shankar from his podcast, uh, the Hidden Brain podcast on NPR. His name, name may be familiar to you because it's a really well-known podcast. And what this book did is take a deeper look at something that we don't typically appreciate as much, which is the ways that we delude ourselves. And if I said to you, there's going to be a book about the ways you delude yourself, the first thing you'd probably think is, well, the book will teach you how not to do that. But actually, this book doesn't do that. Uh, this book instead argues that sometimes those self-delusions might actually be worthwhile. So here's a passage from the book that, that spotlights that. What psychological benefit does holding a false belief confer on the people who hold it? If the stories have resonance and power, does it really matter if they are true? Why put the emphasis on the truth or the falsity of stories rather than on what those stories do for us? This, like his podcast, really did give me a pause to think about something that I had not appreciated quite enough, which is the moments in our lives when we do tell ourselves fantasies or falsities uh, and how they actually help us to maybe get through the day uh, and why they might not be such a bad thing. So this book was a great questioning of that. And so I enjoyed it for that reason. The next book on our list was The 1619 Project, uh, created by Nicole Hannah-Jones. Um, and contributed to by many others. The 1619 Project, created by Nicole Hannah-Jones, was a winner for the shortlist at the Non-Obvious Book Awards 2021. And this book you may have heard of has been absolutely exploding. And what was fascinating about this book is the structure of it, this, this style of nonfiction essays combined with poetry, lots of different stories, a very kind of fast paced, even though it's quite a thick book. Uh, it was just a really uniquely done book on an important topic. And it spotlighted some, some interesting stories that are too frequently missing. So let me share with you a quote from this particular book. 
Black people, however, were largely absent from the histories I read. The vision of the past I absorbed from school textbooks, television, and the local history museum depicted a world, perhaps a wishful one, where Black people did not really exist. We appeared only when unavoidable. And so this gives you a sense of what the perspective of the book is going to be. And it really does take you into uh, a different side of history. And I think we need more books like that, not just for schools, but for all of us to understand the different sides and elements and people that were part of history that have been largely written out of it uh, because of how we typically learn history. Uh, and this was an important book to allow people to do that. And so that's why it was on the short list. Next title on the short list is Nine Nasty Words by John McWhorter. Nine Nasty Words, English in the Gutter, Then, Now, and Forever by John McWhorter was selected for the Non-Obvious Book Awards 2021 shortlist. This was a fun book to read for anybody who loves English, <laughs> anybody who was an English major um, and who just wants to understand why we use or don't use uh, certain curse words. And the book takes a deep dive, curse word by curse word, into why we choose to use certain words, how they factored into our language, where they came from, where they didn't. And it breaks down a lot of myths about, oh, we think the word came from this, but it actually came from, from that. So it's about the history of words. It's about linguistics. Uh, the author is actually a linguistics professor. Um, and so it's a, it gets a little geeky in the academics of linguistics, but it's a fun read because it it's still about curse words. And so let me share with you a quote from this to let you get a sense of it. Onlookers have sucked in their breath to hear the medieval person damning someone to hell, the 20s flapper telling someone to go F themselves, and our neighbor calling someone a bitch. This book will explain why. So I'm trying not to get censored by uh, Amazon or any of the other places we're going to be posting the reviews. So hopefully I managed to make it through without getting censored for that. Uh, but you get a sense of what this book's going to be about. It's a small format. It's a great gift book uh, for anybody who is thinking about giving it to the English major slash reader in the family. Uh, it was just a fun, fun read. Definitely recommend it and, uh, and a choice for our shortlist. Next title on the shortlist is a book called Spite by Simon McCarthy Jones. Spite, The Upside of Your Dark Side by Simon McCarthy Jones was selected for the 2021 Non-Obvious Book Awards shortlist. This was a book about something that we generally do not think is a good thing, which is spite or acting out of spite. And yet, as the author spotlights, there may be a use for it. So let me share a quote from the book with you. It turns out spite can be a force for good. It can help us excel. It can help us create and it does not necessarily threaten cooperation. In fact, paradoxically, it may spur it. Spite does not inevitably produce injustice. In fact, it may be one of our most powerful tools for preventing it. This is not the perspective you typically hear about spite. Uh, and so making this a choice for our non-obvious book awards was a natural fit because it really does get you to rethink something that most people feel is bad in all situations. Uh, and argues that in some situations, it may not be quite so bad. So for that reason alone, I highly recommend this book, and I suggest that you do pick it up. The next title is one that you may have seen earlier in our broadcast, which is Subtract uh, by Letty Klotz. Subtract, the untapped science of less by Letty Klotz, is selected for the 2021 Non-Obvious Book Awards shortlist. This book, aside from having a great cover and minimalist dust jacket design, uh, talked about something that you may have heard in other spaces before, which is this idea of like too much choice, uh, the paradox of choice. But actually, this offered a slightly different perspective than all of the give people less choices um, type of, of academic works. Instead, what it said is we naturally, as humans, seem to gravitate towards adding things to solve problems as opposed to removing things. And the author starts with giving us a really interesting example with Legos of how he had to solve a Lego challenge. And uh, in order to make something sturdier, he added Legos, uh, which seems natural. Uh, but then he watched uh, his, uh, one of his kids 
actually take away Legos to achieve the same effect. And they conducted extensive tests on the same thing and found over and over again that people did seem to have a bias towards adding. I mean, let me share a quote from the book with you. If subtracting is as useful as addition, yet is used less often, then there's untapped potential. People are consistently neglecting a basic way to make a change. Such neglect would have something to say about our tendencies to clutter our homes, schedules, and minds. So this book was a really great reminder that sometimes removing things can help you get to the same effect. And there was this really beautiful graphic in the book, actually, of a grid. Uh, and it was kind of a four quadrant grid. And you had to match the right side to the left side. And there were like five boxes or six boxes shaded on the left. And there were three shaded on the on the sorry, uh, on the left and, and three shaded on the other side. And most people, when they said match the two, would take the side with five, uh, with three boxes and add two to make it five. So five and five. Only very few people took the five and removed two, erased two, but it achieved the same thing. And so that's what this book was really about, which is reminding us that sometimes subtraction is the best way to do this. So if you've made it this far, you know that we are at the very end of the show with the five winners for the non-obvious book awards, the absolute five best books. And what we do with the books, which is a little bit unusual, is we spotlight our five winners, not based on category like sales books or marketing books or uh, other types of books. We spotlight them based on five specific groups, five specific kind of categories, most useful, most entertaining, most important, uh, uh, things like that. So let's start with our first choice for a winner for the non-obvious book award, uh, which is Think Again by Adam Grant for Most Useful. Think Again by Adam Grant is the winner of the non-obvious book awards 2021 most useful book, which is a practical idea with a real down-to-earth advice on how to use it in your daily life. This book signature Adam Grant was filled with things that you can do to change the way that you experience the world and encourages people to think again. Let me share a quote from the book with you. Thinking like a scientist involves more than just reacting with an open mind. It means being actively open-minded. It requires searching for reasons we might be wrong, not for reasons why we must be right, and revising our views based on what we learn. So the entire aim of this book is to encourage us to rethink the beliefs that we have and why we have them. And if you can imagine a better thing to be thinking about right now in a moment when we get so entrenched, people get so entrenched in the beliefs that they have that they're unwilling to consider that anything else or any other belief might actually be true. Uh, it's really important to be able to think again. And so this was critical. Uh, and the book was a fantastic exploration of that. Next title uh, that we're going to share is Move by Parag Khanna, which is our winner for Most Shareable. Move, The Forces Uprooting Us by Parag Khanna is a winner for the Most Shareable Book of 2021 in the Non-Obvious Book Awards, which is a viral idea that people will or should be talking about in conversation. Move was a book about why we choose to go to different places and how much impact that has on our futures and also on what we choose to do. And in a time when more people have chosen to move because of pandemic and because of the shifts that have been happening, this is a totally on point book for 2021 uh, because it really spotlights and talks about what our geograph geographical choices mean for us. And let me share with you a quote from the book. The answer to what people will do in the future very much depends on where they move to do it. This underscores the reality that our main challenge is not man versus robots, but skills versus geography. And this book features lots of demographic data from well-known points, such as uh, the fact that po our world's population after a certain point, which is coming relatively soon, will start decreasing every year. Uh, from then onwards. Uh, and most demographic experts predict that. And so the real question is going to be, where are those people going to live? And in particular, where are the young people going to live to replenish the populations? And 
what will that mean for our global futures at a time when people are living longer? And this book explores all of that. So there's lots of research in this. If you love statistics, if you love charts, this book's got all of those things. And it also just looks at a really, really important and shareable topic, which is where are we going to go? Where are we going to live? Uh, and it takes a deep dive into that. Next book we selected for the finalist and winner for the Non-Obvious Book Awards for Most Entertaining Book is Four Lost Cities by Annalee Newitz. Four Lost Cities, A Secret History of the Urban Age by Anna Lee Newitz was the winner for the most entertaining book of 2021 in the Non-Obvious Book Awards. This book was absolutely a joy to read. It was fun. It was taking you backwards through history. It was one of those books that I really couldn't put down, which sounds like an odd thing to say about a nonfiction book, but this one did really capture my attention and was a, a, a wonderful read. And if you're a lover of history, it's going to be a great one for you. But also, it was just a great read because uh, it was fun um, and looked at a topic that you don't typically hear about, which is these lost cities. And the point that really stood out to me actually comes from a quote, which I'd like to read for you right now, which is, I realized that every city's death feels like a mystery because we usually look at its demise in isolation. We focus on the moments of dramatic loss and forget its long life history. I don't think we can understand why people choose to let their cities die until we consider the very specific ways they lived. And that's what this book does. It doesn't focus on the collapse, on the death. It looks at cultures and civilizations that existed for a thousand years or sometimes even longer and asks the question of what did they do during the thousand years? not what did they do in the last few years before the collapse. And what it really does spotlight is how these things happen over a long period of time and for different reasons. And what I liked about the book also is that it took some lessons from civilizations that have uh, not collapsed but declined uh, over a long period of time and tried to pull out some lessons for us at an important moment in human history where we could go in multiple directions. And one of the reasons for population collapse is climate and climate change. And those are some real risks for us right now. Um, and so are we facing the last days of our civilization? I mean, that seems to be one of the questions that's sort of asked in the book. And some of the lessons in the book do help you kind of think about that. So Again, wonderful book, amazing read, definitely entertaining, worth getting. And by the way, the paperback of that book is coming out next month, so you can get it in paperback very soon too. Next book on our list is When We Cease to Understand the World, which was our winner for the most original book. When We Cease to Understand the World by Benjamin Labutat is the winner for the most original book of 2021 in the Non-Obvious Book Awards. This book has been getting rave reviews. In fact, after we had selected it and put together our whole presentation in this past weekend's uh, best books of 2021 in the New York Times, this was one of the books selected. And what was fascinating about it is it was actually selected in the fiction category, even though we selected it in the nonfiction category because it's a crossover book. Um, it really does span kind of two sides. Um, it takes you into both. It talks about real stories, but has an element of fiction to bring them to life. And I want to share a quote to give you a sense of what it, you know, what it talks about. On the morning of August 31st, 2012, the Japanese mathematician Shinichi Mochizuki published four articles on his blog. Those 600 pages contained a proof of one of the most important conjectures in number theory, known as A plus B equals C. To this day, no one has managed to comprehend it. I mean, this book has intrigue. When you read a certain par paragraph like that, you just want to kind of keep going. Uh, it's not a long book. Um, it's actually a translated book uh, as well. Uh, but it just has a fascinating story to tell. It was, uh, I think, nominated or won a Booker Prize also. Uh, so lots and lots of people are giving this book lots and lots of love. Uh, and based on my reading of it and our team's assessment, uh, it definitely deserves it. So pick this one up. It's a it's a great read. Uh, definitely worth it. Uh, highly enjoyable. And the final book that I want to spotlight is the most important book of the year, which is The Lonely Century by Norina Hertz. The Lonely Century, How to Restore Human Connection in a World That's Pulling Apart by Norina Hertz 
was the winner for the most important book of 2021 in the non-obvious book awards. This book was all about something that we all are struggling with and will likely continue to be struggling with uh, as we get older, which is loneliness in many ways. And, and by the way, when we think about loneliness, what this book starts off by describing is that loneliness is not about being alone. People can feel lonely even as they're surrounded by people uh, because it's a feeling of isolation. It's a feeling of separateness. And what this book looks at on a much bigger and broader level, and it's quite a thick, it's it's probably, you know, I mean, it's like this, this, you know, it's not a thin book. Um, but in this book, uh, the author really explores every dimension of loneliness and why it happens and what we need to actually think about um, when it comes to solving this plague of loneliness. And in particular, let me share this quote with you. The virus has thrown even into even starker relief just how uncared for and unsupported so many of us feel. If we are to mitigate loneliness, not just at an individual level, but also at a societal one, we urgently need the dominant forces that shape our lives to wake up to the scale of the problem. And that's really what this book does. It spotlights the scale of the problem when it comes to loneliness and how we can actually reimagine a solution. And so for that reason, it was selected as our non-obvious book award winner for the most important book of 2021. And there you have it. Those are our choices for the short list of the best books of 2021, uh, which are the 10 titles on the short list and then the five winners. We also have an entire long list of amazing books that you should be checking out. And those are all available at the website uh, for the book awards also, which is nonobviousbookawards.com. So if you want to check out any of those books, if you want to check out any of these books, please do. Thank you for joining me for this special edition of the Non-Obvious Book Review, where we talked about the best books of the year. It was an absolute joy to share them with you. I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed these books and I'm going to keep going back. And, you know, maybe I might, uh, now that the book awards are over, I might actually read some fiction. So that's my plan. I hope you enjoy these recommendations and you do pick up some of these books. Thank you for joining me. And remember, always stay non-obvious. <laughs>